Hey, welcome to episode 116 of the Hangar Z podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicast. In this three-part series, we sit down with Matt Saluka. Matt's currently employed as a state trooper and fixed-wing aircraft pilot with the Illinois State Police in the Chicagoland area. Matt was born and raised in the Chicago area and has lived in the city his entire life. Prior to joining the Illinois State Police Air Operations Bureau as a pilot, Matt was assigned as a cannon handler to the Illinois State Police statewide anti-violence enforcement team and the District 15 criminal patrol team. Outside of his law enforcement duties, Matt works part-time as an instructor at a local college, teaching aviation classes to aspiring pilots. Matt has 12 years of law enforcement experience at three different police departments in Chicago. Outside of being a pilot and cannon handler, Matt has experience as a member of the Illinois State Police Chicago Region Crowd Control Team, as a canine instructor, a canine crowd control instructor, a field training officer, and evidence technician. Before Matt entered law enforcement, he was an airline captain at a large regional airline that serves cities across North America and the Bahamas. During his time in the airlines, Matt was a human factors facilitator and crew resource management instructor. Matt received a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Illinois in Aviation Human Factors, which spurred his passion for human interaction with advanced technologies, particularly as it relates to aviation. Matt now focuses his efforts on supporting his fellow brothers and sisters on the ground, utilizing aircraft and other technologies for criminal enforcement, especially in the city of Chicago, a place he has proudly called home for 42 years. I'd like to throw a shout out to our sponsors, Metro Aviation, Garmin, and CNC Technologies. Cheers. Welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts. The Hangar Z Podcast is the first and only podcast dedicated to promoting and exploring the personnel and equipment behind the missions in public safety aviation. Join your host, John Gray, Jeff Ratkovich, and Jack Shanley. Still southbound, skidding to a stop. Stand by here. Looks like they're getting ready to bail. Heads up, guys, bailing. Okay, the guy, he's running through the house, jumping the fence, through the shotgun, threw something out. Grabbing the shotgun. Don't go over that fence. Don't go over that fence. Grab the shotgun again. He is armed. Stay there. Hold your position. Four on the stop. Good advising, Coach on the stop. Hey, welcome to the Hangar Z Podcast. I'm your host, John Gray. Have a really cool conversation lined up for today. Uh, Matt Saluka has joined us to talk about his agency, and I'll I'll let him introduce his agency. But it's it is a large state agency, but we can give you some more detail than that as as we go. To help us talk about Matt and his his career and his agency is is Jack Shanley. How you doing, Jack? Very good. Good to be with you, gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, again, really stoked to have you as as a as a co-host on the show and. The fact that you've joined us is is a big deal. So thanks for for doing that again, and look forward to all these conversations. This in particular will be re- really interesting because Matt's got a background in canines, and I know you've got a passion for that. I do, I do. So thanks yeah. for having me again. And now I I got the light, so it's official. You can't get rid of me, John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can't get rid of you now. Can't jump yes. off board either. You get you're stuck. It's blood in, blood out. <laughs> deal, deal. So Matt, how are you doing, sir? I'm great. Thanks for having me, you guys. Really appreciate you uh, bringing me on the show. I feel pretty honored. You guys have had some uh, heavy hitters in terms of guests. I'm pretty humbled to be on here and talking to you, John, and especially you, Jack, with your background and stuff like that. So, yeah, thanks yeah. for uh, thanks for bringing me on. It's an honor to have you. We, Matt, you actually reached out and and you and I did a, a podcast for the the street training st- street cop training podcast not long ago. Yep, and that was a lot of fun talking to folks that are outside of aviation that don't have a whole lot of knowledge of aviation is, was really cool. And you did a really good job of, of explaining things in a way that people that aren't in aviation would understand. So I was impressed with that. Uh, and that goes to Thanks. lends to your overall background, I guess, and we'll get into your, your background as we go as a CFI and an airline pilot and, and now flying for the Illinois state police. Yeah, that was a really great podcast. Like I said, it was, it was awesome to do with you because a lot of the, you know, a training company, they're trying to do things with interdiction and, and guys and gals that are out here hunting, you know, and this is a tremendous resource for them. So that's why I thought kind of cross exposing and joining forces there to talk about it exposes uh, how much aviation and law enforcement is an asset to the, those men and women. They're out there trying to find bad guys. Right. So. Yeah. The, the interdiction conversation was really good. And I, I, yeah. I love, uh, I love the idea of interdiction and the, the, the cat and mouse game that goes with that. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to dig into your role in interdiction as, as we go through your background. Before we get too deep into the conversation, we got to go to drink the day. You know, Jeff's not with us here today, so I'm standing, standing in his shoes. I brought alkaline water, electrolyte water with me today. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I channeled my inner Jack this morning and, and got on the bike. It was actually a Peloton ride, but uh, got a good Peloton. Very nice. 
man, I'll tell you what, those workouts freaking sweat during those. So, uh, I felt like to, <laughs> yeah. to hydrate, I probably should throw some, some electrolyte water in. The wife just bought some for me at Trader Joe's. So that's what I got. And then I got it in my, uh, Goodwin and Sons market little cup back in March. We had a blizzard here and, uh, our really good friends, some of our best friends, they lost their, their grocery store during that storm. The roof collapsed, leaving the whole West side of our community, uh, without a grocery store. And it's been, it's been rough having them out of, out of order and, and they're working to, to, to open their doors again, hopefully by March of this next year. But in their honor, I've got this good one in Suns Cup. So thank you, Mike, Jess, and, uh, Jack, what's your drink of the day? Uh, high quality H2O <laughs> in my hangar Z, in my hangar Z mug. All right. Yeah. That was, that mug was from the leadership episode. And that it was, was, that was a really was. fun it's a conversation. great mug, by the way. It's an awesome mug. Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. Matt, what's your drink of the day today? I'm drinking black coffee because I'm an adult. <laughs> and I have it in my love you dad mug for my kids that they gave me. Uh, it's actually, uh, it's bison union coffee. Oh, cool. I never heard of it. It's uh, no, I have. a veteran known company. Oh, you have? Okay. Awesome. Yeah. They're in Sheridan, Wyoming. Uh, I like their coffee. They got cool, uh, cool branding. It's good coffee. This yeah. is bear fight. So yeah, but I like, I like what they do. We got to, I sent them a couple patches they have up on their wall of respect for law enforcement. Oh, so nice. cool. I like to support yeah. businesses that do that stuff, you know, it's nice. Yeah. So yeah, I think if it's, I think it's their company, they, they do a limited run of ceramic mugs every so often. They do. Yeah. yeah. The, they're like handmade ceramic mugs. They're really nice. Yeah, so I, I love pricey, but but nice. So. Right, I love stuff like that when I get my hands on it. Yeah, it, it is yeah. pricey, but it, the fact that it's handmade, I, you know, is is the reason why, and I, I appreciate that. So, always down to support a company like that. Since we're all drinking non-alcoholic beverages, hopefully, I can make it to Abscon this next Abscon, and we can make <laughs> up for it. <laughs> yeah, what yeah. would your drink of the day be if if this were a, a PM edition? Uh, I'm a big. I like craft beers. And I'm getting into whiskeys too. Uh, my father-in-law to be is a big whiskey guy, and I'm kind of getting into it. So, um, other than that, I drink uh, Labatt Blue Light. That's I play ice hockey, so the post game is the Labatt Blue Light. So, okay. that's I'm right. a big Blue Light guy. Yeah. Okay. Jack, I'm all over the place. Being in in Oregon, craft craft beers is very popular here, and it's nice to experiment with a few things there but yeah for for today the high quality h2o is the way to go for today <laughs> yeah uh the, the area of oregon that you're in it is a kind of a mecca for 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 craft breweries oh yeah and, uh, it's been cool seeing a lot of the, the companies come out of there i feel like you guys have had a, a really high representation of successful companies breweries coming out of of your area there's a bunch that have uh gone from small time to big time and yeah. uh it's very popular. There's, I think there's close to 30 uh, in Bend. San Diego is kind of the same way. They've uh, really kind of identified themselves as a, as a beer city, a destination city. And uh, we were down there for Echo not long ago, and it was, it was awesome. The, the, the show was awesome. We didn't get out to see many of the breweries, but there was plenty of beers to be had at, at Echo, so made up for it. <laughs> so anyways, that's Drink of the Day. Let's hop into the hot seat. You know, this is going to be released right around thanksgiving so uh this is kind of a thanksgiving themed hot seat edition i feel like depending on what family you're a part of there's some really weird dishes that get served on on thanksgiving table but of all those dishes matt we'll start with you what's your favorite thanksgiving dish to have oh boy mashed potatoes that's make or break they've got to be good if they're too like you know gooey or you know soupy or whatever not good if they're too crunchy, not good. They just got to be just right. And that's, I'm always getting like two or three helpings of mashed potatoes. <laughs> yeah, right on. Yeah. I like the, the chunky ones with chunky potato and then garlic the skin in them. them. Oh yeah. That's yeah. good stuff right there. Yeah. Jack, how about you? I'm, I'm with Matt on that. I really like good mashed potatoes. Uh, I'm from Pennsylvania. So stuffing is very uh, popular and, uh, and I'm not a big fan of that. So I'm, I'm always the mashed potato guy. I get yeah. made fun of, but that's okay. <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> My mother-in-law, her family's from New Mexico, and green hatch chili is a, a big deal in New Mexico. So she has a green hatch chili stuffing recipe that has sausage in it and green green hatch chili and the breadcrumbs. It is absolutely amazing. So I tend to not be a, a stuffing guy, but her stuffing is it, it's yeah. it's top notch. Oh, and, and by the way, so that I don't get uh, ridiculed by my Pennsylvania Dutch friends and including my wife. 
it's filling in Pennsylvania. <laughs> there are two different things. Stuffing and filling are two different things. Just so we're clear. <laughs> I appreciate the clarification on that. That's oh, great. I'm just saving myself, John. <laughs> we're going to talk about the airline thing, but you just gave me a huge craving now because I remember flying to Albuquerque, New Mexico is one of our destinations. And every single time I went to that airport, there was a place in there that had like a green chicken chili soup. Yeah. And it, when you mentioned that, it immediately went in my head and now I'm yeah. craving it. So <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. Right. Yeah. yeah. That, that green hatch chili is really good. It's in mm-hmm. a lot of stuff. It's made its way to Southern California, I guess, because we're not super far from New Mexico, but you see it in the, in the supermarket fairly often now and you didn't used to see it before. So that's cool. But I think for me, I, I love Turkey. I used to hate Turkey, but I think what changed it for me was the, was the rise of Traegers and like those kinds of smoking mm-hmm. barbecues. Cause I yeah. found that when you smoke Turkey, it's it tastes way better and it's not dry. I feel like you know as a kid, all I did was eat dry turkey all the time. Sorry, mom, yeah. but your, your turkey was not too good. <laughs> but yeah, I think now with you know a combination of the smokers and and some of the other cooking mechanisms that are out there, uh, turkey's gotten a lot better. It's not it's not dry and nasty anymore. And you know some people love to deep fry it. And I, have you guys had deep fried turkey? I have not. No, no? I haven't. If it, so if, I'm too if, worried if it, about blowing up my house. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yes. Yeah. The house is on fire, but the turkey was great. Yeah. <laughs> How was the turkey? It was great. I sat in the back of a fire truck and ate it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Well, I guess that's a good segue into the next question. Uh, what's the worst dish you've ever had on Thanksgiving? Thank you to our sponsor, Metro Aviation. Metro Aviation, the world's largest family-owned air medical operator, offers comprehensive aircraft services with 140-plus aircraft in over 25 states. The Completions Center installs medical and law enforcement kits and avionics, serving diverse aviation needs, including offshore, utility, VIP, and corporate sectors. I cannot eat cranberries. Oh yeah. Uh, sorry, mom. I use that. Sorry, mom. <laughs> she always will put cranberries on the table, and I just can't, I can't do it. It's just, yep. Especially out of the jar when they just pour it in the jar <laughs> into the little dish, and it's just like a blob. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. You just so. ruined Thanksgiving dinner. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Jack, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> I said to Matt before we went live that we have a lot in common. Boy, oh boy, do we have a lot in common, Matt? <laughs> I mean, even more than the some of the stuff we already talked about with the last names and pronunciations and stuff. I'm not a cranberry guy either. I, I like cranberry a little bit like on a turkey sandwich kind of thing, but just cranberries to eat them. No, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think that's I skipped a, that. Yeah. That's a unifying question for all of us. Cause I don't like it either. I think it's absolutely disgusting. It's the one thing that does not belong on the kitchen table or the, the family table. I think it's good. Right. So, wow. That's pretty that's, harsh. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. The truth is harsh sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> right. It is. Uh, <laughs> The last question, again, going back to weird family traditions, I feel like a lot of families have a, a, maybe not weird, but a unique family tradition when it comes to the holidays. Matt, what odd Thanksgiving holiday does your family have if they have one? You know, we don't really have an odd Thanksgiving holiday thing. I mean, we, it's just pretty traditional. I think the oddest thing was doing it on off days because when I was an airline pilot, we might have it on Monday when Thanksgiving is on Thursday. Yeah. So that was kind of that. Or uh, a couple of times you know, being the police that have to work on Thanksgiving. So we do Thanksgiving at 1230 or something instead of at five or four or whatever we would do. So other than that, we're pretty traditional with it. So. Okay. Jack. Nothing odd. I mean, it was very straightforward. I mean, as a kid growing up, it was a time with family and cousin, a lot of cousins and it was a lot of football playing and stuff like that in the yard. But it, in California, uh, it was very traditional. We adjusted it too, though for days and yeah uh my wife tracy was in retail so retail's been all over the map on when they work around thanksgiving and so Mm -hmm. it was uh we moved things around as well because of police work and retail too very unstable yeah (laughs) Yeah. jobs with uh holidays yeah work starts at about 4 a.m on thanksgiving uh, friday for most people in retail now right sometimes it was midnight yeah it it, it, it's crazy it's crazy the the stuff that Mm -hmm. they did to the retail workers yeah, uh, yeah that's, aside from from that, Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday for the year because there's no expectations of anything but spending time together with people, you know. And I love yeah, that about it. Good. It's 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 a good holiday. There's always football involved. There's always you know a good beer or two to be had, 
and and good food. Mm-hmm. The worst thing about Thanksgiving is the belly aches. I guess that come afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> but that's about it. Um, oh, I agree with you. That's that's a really good point about that. With the, yeah. that is in terms of the holidays. So yeah, yeah. But you know, like you guys, I remember working patrol and and eating. My family would bring some Tupperware dishes and we'd put it in the hood of the car and use the car to kind of warm it up and you get five or 10 minutes of your family to, to eat before you got a radio call and had to leave. But that was, yeah, that, that was always rough. So cheers to you all out there holding, holding it down this Thanksgiving while you're working. So that's the hot seat and, and drink of the day. Uh, again, Matt, really honored to have you on the podcast. Really excited to dig into your background and, and what you guys are doing in Illinois to police. You guys are doing some really cool stuff. Uh, you're operating in a fixed wing program and, uh, uh on my social media account this this last week, I, I posted a, a meme. I almost didn't post because of you. It was a, it was, it was a joke that was geared towards fixed wing aviation. Oh, I uh, saw it. I, I just screenshotted it. I was going to text you. I was going to be like, no, I'm done. I'm not coming on. <laughs> I, I saw it. Oh, I you should have done that. I literally <laughs> screenshotted it right before my class. I teach at a college. I, I screenshotted it. I was going to text you and I got so busy I forgot. <laughs> I yeah. That's funny. Yeah, we, we got a lot of love for you. You guys are doing some amazing things and with, with your program yeah. and the fixed wing programs across the country. And, you know, just it, it's a slightly different way of doing it and, and mm-hmm. some good, some bad and, and vice versa with with uh, helicopters. You know, some of what we're doing is good and some of what we're doing is bad. It's really cool, like going down to Orange County Sheriff's in Florida for AppsCon, getting to talk to them. They've got a really unique program where they've mixed their fixed wing and, and helicopter assets together. Mm-hmm. So when they're fixed wing asset thinks that a helicopter better serve whatever incident they're working they'll 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 call it in so i thought it was a really efficient way to to merge both types of of assets in in under one program so and uh, we'll get into it but uh since we don't have helicopters what's nice is chicago police does and the federal agencies have helicopters and a lot of times like last night uh, Chicago police helicopter was up. We were in the fixed wing and we work together because sometimes it'll happen. We're like, we're getting on the car together. We'll follow the driver. They'll follow the passengers or we got to evacuate airspace. And I know we're going to get into this stuff, but it, it's sometimes it feels like we have both just because we work so well with the other agencies. So, yeah. And that's a whole nother conversation by itself. You know, a lot of agencies, they could be neighbors, but don't talk, you know? So I, it's great that you guys have a relationship with, with Chicago you guys have a working relationship and, and count each other for those types of things. I think it's a little probably less common now for agencies that are that are neighbors to, to not uh, interact very much. I feel like our community has gotten a lot smaller through social media and the fly-ins and the different things that that we do. But I think there's still there's still some of that out there. And hopefully that continues to go away. Jack, I know you guys had a really good relationship with with your kind of neighbors and partners. How did you guys how did you guys foster those relationships i think it was just by just by putting cops on the ground first and saying the street cop matters no matter what badge or uniform they wear and we were all believers in that that was a a philosophy at the the unit and people knew you could be in manhattan beach or torrance or or you know uh, pasadena even the units that had air air units if they were down we would always go help if we didn't have something as a priority and they knew it and we'd stay with them as long as we possibly could. We'd give them our best. They didn't get a bill. They didn't, they just, it was just that way. And I think uh, that, that happened long before I got to the unit. And I think we just continued to do it. And, and, and uh, it's all a matter of just letting them know that they're important and that their safety is important to us as a unit and that they should call us. Yeah. So you guys being that you fly 20 hours a day, I'm sure there's a lot of weird calls. Your watch commanders fielded at three in the morning when no other, no other aviation unit is, is in service. What's the furthest you remember responding for a call for assistance when you're in the aviation program? Temecula. Wow. (laughs) Uh, that's a long way, Matt, just so you know, in a a helicopter. Google map out here. (laughs) That's a, that's a quite a flight to get out there. Uh, but it, it was it, it related to something uh, with with LA units and but it wasn't unusual to we, we went to Long Beach regularly a, a lot of play on CHP you know we, we would go to their pursuits at three four in the morning and those could be anywhere so I would imagine that the furthest I ever went was I'm jo- partially joking about the Temecula I mean I went there on on a mission but where there was no LA units involved it would have been CHP stuff 
mm-hmm. where we end up who knows where. You know, yeah. you could end up out, out by you guys uh, in San Bernardino County and Ontario area easily in a CHP pursuit. And yeah. that happened regularly. Yeah. Well, Matt, for you guys being that you're a state agency, do you guys find yourselves assist- assisting other states with some of their requests from time to time? Uh, not really other states. We do have stuff come across the, because uh, the close proximity of Chicago to Indiana, we'll have Indiana pursuits that come into Chicago because they, they chase everything in Indiana and we don't. So they always chase it out of Indiana and then they cross the border <laughs> thinking they'll stop and they don't. So we'll, we'll latch on to uh, pursuits coming from Indiana state police or some of the neighboring towns or, or sheriff's offices and things like that. Cause they'll usually come to onto our interstates. Um, but we don't do a lot of stuff where we'll cross the border and go help them um, just cause there's way too much stuff going on over here. So yeah, same thing happens. You know, I work in Chicago. So a lot of stuff I'll talk about is related to Chicago, but you know, we have major metro down south too, because there's East St. Louis, that uh, that whole area that's just across the river. So they have the same thing there. Missouri will chase things across the border into Illinois, or vice versa, they'll chase them across the border into Missouri. So there's some uh, some cross border stuff down there too. I'm really inter- interested to hear about Chicago. You know, I really have, I've never been to Chicago. I've never really been to the area on the ground. All I've heard is what's talked about in the media, and I know based on our conversation previously that you know what the media is saying that's happening or not happening in the area is different from what your experience has been. You know, yeah. a lot of the, a lot of the news media refers to Chicago as Chirac and you, know, you see videos and you can hear distinct gunfire automatic. sounds like automatic gunfire in, in, in the Chicago area. So as a tourist, I'm like, I don't know if I want to go, but people do say that the Chicago culinary wise is, is probably one of the better cities in the country. So what's your take on, on, the portrayal of Chicago and in, in that area as far as you know what they're saying. Thank you to our sponsor Garmin. Be ready for the most challenging missions with the Garmin G500H TXI Avionics Suite. Get terrain and power line awareness plus optional 3D synthetic vision and NVG compatibility with industry leading product support. Details at garmin.com. I think it comes with anything in social media. I'm not a big social media guy because I think there's so much false narratives on any topic whatsoever. And Chicago is one of them, right? I'm not going to pretend to come on here and lie to you guys and pretend like there's not a lot going on here. There is a lot going on here. It's it's in pretty bad shape right now. But I think one of the, the narratives is that you can't police here. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> we go out and police all the time. We're getting in, in pursuits. We're going after these guys. It's just a high volume of stuff going on right now. I think a lot of the stuff that is going on has historically gone on, but it's been kept to different neighborhoods and things like that, where it was like, just don't go there and you'll be fine. The problem is it's kind of spilling everywhere. It's spilling into the suburbs, it's spilling into our downtown area and things like that. And that's what's guarding the attention of it. But it was always there. The mission hasn't changed. But the Chirac thing, like we had a call last night. We followed armed robbers to a residence um, with the aircraft uh, that had done some armed robberies, a stolen car. And while they were on scene, there was 60 rounds fired. I think one of the big, you know, a couple blocks away from from all of the officers, you know, they're like, we got 60 rounds automatic gunfire. Then now my thing has changed. My mission's changed from providing perimeter security on this incident here to now searching for any fleeing cars or people running with guns and things like that. There's stuff going on, but Chicago's not dead. Chicago's still rolling. We're still pushing, and I think it can be recovered. So yeah, well, as a as a sports fan, I'm. Excited to come to, to Chicago. I'm an Angels fan, Angels baseball fan, which that's another story by itself. I know. Are you excited to of, come here because you're going to win? Because <laughs> all of our teams are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. Of being an Angels yeah. fan, we'll probably lose. So you you probably will win. But uh, oh, I, no. I, I want to come to Chicago and, and see an interleague game between the Angels and the and the Cubs. You know, seeing a, a, a game at Wrigley Field is historic. So I, I want to yeah. make my way out there. So it's good to hear what you're saying. Uh, and mix that with some good culinary and it'll be good. Jack, you've done a little bit of training in that area for folks on the ground. What, was your, what was your experience? It was, it's always been good. Uh, I was with the Illinois Tactical Officers Association. I've probably have done classes for them at least four, five, six times over the years. I haven't been there in a while, but it was always, most of the time out near Oak Brook uh, is where they held it. But there were officers from all of the region and... I mean, I, there were times when I had three, 400 people in the class. I mean, it was very enthusiastic, very hardworking officers, very tactical oriented. The people that ran I2 the OA were wonderful, all positive from the law enforcement side of things that I had there. 
And I can't say that that for everywhere I've ever gone. Uh, I always liked it. Yeah. And like you said, the culinary stuff, I mean, Chicago has its own culture, right? Like it's just, it's just, I've lived here for 42 years and I travel and like, we're talking about the airline thing. I travel and I have the opportunity to move and I could never do it. I just love it here. Like, you know, the, the amount of food, the diversity here, if you want to go get authentic, any food, you're going to get authentic food, whether it's Mexican food, Chinese food, Korean food, Japanese food. I've gone to Japanese restaurants where you take your shoes off at the front door. There's a pile of shoes and you go sit at the table, you know, the short tables and stuff and you're sitting on pillows and just, it's just, amazing and that's what one of the greatest things about this city is the diversity of it and being able to you know be exposed to all these different cultures and their food and everything like that i'll tell you i used to work near pilsen which is on the southwest side it's a uh, historically hispanic mexican neighborhood and the food there is out of this world just traveled mexico last year and the food is like the exact i mean it's just tremendous it's so good yeah, so right on well it's good to know i'll have to be, make my out there maybe we can uh, plead for rapscon to, to make an appearance out there I was looking for somewhere that has some good food, right? That was kind of a, a random rabbit hole we went down, but uh, really <laughs> interesting to hear about Chicago and, yeah. and what's happening there. I'd like to start kind of digging into your your background. You talked about living in the Chicago area your whole life. Can you talk about growing up there, where you went to school and, and what that was like? I was born in Indiana, but I moved here a couple of days later. So um, <laughs> I wasn't born in Chicago, but I was raised in Chicago and I've lived here my whole life on the South side in the city. So I lived in the city limits of Chicago. And uh, on the south side, the northwest side, there's a lot of like police, fire, public you know, workers and things like that. My mom was a public school teacher. My dad worked in federal law enforcement. How I got the aviation bug, I don't know, probably Top Gun or something. But <laughs> it was since I was really, really young. I carried a toy helicopter around all the time which is now in my display case with all my stuff. That's cool. And I was just in the airplanes. And my dad brought me this book of drawings that I had from when I was seven. And half the drawings in there are police helicopters and police cars. It's kind of crazy how that works. So I decided I wanted to be a pilot. I was going to try to go into the military. I got into the Air Force Academy and got an Air Force scholarship, but at the last minute decided to go Navy. I wanted to be a Navy pilot and land on boats. So I I, uh, went to college at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, which is downstate. A really good aviation program there. I started the aviation program, started flying there. It was just a weird time for trying to get into the military and jobs and things like that. This was uh, right before 9-11. And it was really hard to get into the military and get flying slots. And there was a lot of uh, guys and gals that I was in those programs with that wanted to be pilots, but they weren't going to get it because you had to have your certain grades and be ranked in your class with this, this, and this. And I was like, you know, there's some other ways I can do this. I'm going to go the civilian route. And then I'm going to look at the International Guard to do the, the military stuff. I think that's the best. I want to go into the airlines. This is really interesting to me. I love travel. I love like culture and like all that we were talking about eating and all that stuff. I love it going and, and experience other cultures and travel in the world. So I'm going to go do this. So as soon as I graduated from U of I in the aviation program, I got hired in an airline like a month later because I had done an internship with them, which was pretty unheard of because this is 2003. This is two years after 9-11. The industry is still reeling. But it was a very small airline. They had 11 airplanes and they hired me. They said, hey, we have a class next month. You want to be in it? I said, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I started flying a turboprop out of Chicago, out of Midway, right where I grew up with the Chicago skyline on the tail. And I just was like, that was the coolest thing in the world to me. But that airline wasn't doing great, not because of their own, but because of the parent company was was not doing well financially. So I ended up leaving and going and flying for another airline for Continental Express, a company called Express Jet. And that's how I got to Albuquerque. We were talking about yeah. green chili and stuff like that, traveling. And that was awesome because that gave me a lot of opportunities to travel a lot of places. We flew for uh, Continental and eventually United with the merger there. So uh, I was a captain on the regional jet, flew the airlines for eight years, and ended up being a captain for like four years. I was a crew resource management instructor in the airlines. So that was what my degree was in, was in aviation human factors, which is basically crew resource management, engineering psychology, things like that, doing the, the crew resource management in terms of developing checklists, procedures, safety, and all that was, was, was really interested in that stuff. So I'm sure that's come in key with, with your agency now, having all that experience yeah. and, and the ability to, you know, lean into that and, and hope, you know, develop those processes for your agency if hasn't if it wasn't in existence before yeah so we talk uh later about kind of how we work together with the helicopters work as a crew i found that the the human factors crew resource management stuff applies even more to law enforcement flying than it did in the airlines everything's mm-hmm. so standardized in the airlines and that's great 
But here we have checklists, we have procedures, we have SOPs, we have standards and all that. But now we're talking about interacting with ground units and air traffic control and managing a pursuit and interacting with the helicopter and interacting as a crew and things like that. To me, that's it's even more CRM related than anything I was doing in the airline stuff. So Yeah. Going back to Echo real quick, that conference, a lot of the classes they offer there aren't necessarily on the, the law enforcement side. There's a mixture of of hymns, uh, there's you know certain search and rescue element there is big. Coast Guard has a big presence there, so you have these instructors that are coming in from outside segments that aren't law enforcement, but they bring that kind of what you're talking about. They bring this element to, of training, and that really applies to what we're doing in law enforcement. So that was really what I liked. It really kind of forced us to to look outside of our box that we traditionally look in, and and look at how other segments are applying these safety principles. And then look at how we could do use that in, in law enforcement. I think it's really good when we can cross pollinate these different segments, you know, from a safety perspective, because there's a lot to learn, just like you pointed out, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One more thing I want to touch on. Sorry to, to go back into new, another rabbit hole, but you talked about you know, 2002, 2003, uh, how different hiring practices were back then. And I remember at the time I was just finishing college, I was applying for both police departments and fire departments, and I remember for the fire departments, there'd be a couple thousand folks interviewing for like two or three spots, you know, and, and same with aviation, you're competing against you know, these, these huge numbers. So you had to stand out, you had to be in the top 1% to get these, these spots. And then now you look at the, all the waivers that are being issued for folks because the, the numbers are so drawn down, whether it's in aviation or, or law enforcement or fire or anywhere else. It's really interesting to see how timing really comes into play when you're you know, trying to develop your career and all these different things. And it's been fun, I guess, on the the, the podcast to, to talk about all the different pathways to get to where we are, because there's a bunch, you know, I, I think when I was a kid, I thought the military was the only way to do it. But now having talked to, you know, over a hundred folks, everyone's got a different story of how they got there, you know, and there's some, some stories that are similar, but more often than not, they're different. That's, that's pretty interesting. So it's cool to hear how you got into it. After your, your time, eight years as a captain, is that what you said? Thank you to our sponsor, CNC Technologies. CNC Technologies, serving law enforcement, government, and military markets with tailored mission solutions, system training, and live 24 7 support with CNC.live platform. Explore more at cnctechnologies.com. It was eight years as a pilot and four, about four years as a captain. Four as a captain? So half my time was as a captain. Yeah. What kind of uh, drove you to, to leave the airlines? So as I said, growing up in the south side of Chicago and my dad being law enforcement, it was always something that interests me, you know, drawing pictures as a kid and things like that. Growing up around a lot of Chicago police officers and, you know, my neighbor was a Chicago police officer and people in the neighborhood and things like that. It was always just something I was really interested in. And even in college, I did some ride-alongs. I was a member of the student patrol my senior year, just, you know, doing escorts across campus for, you know, for somebody who was studying and then they wanted to walk home. They don't want to walk home in the dark alone. We did that stuff. So it was kind of always interested in law enforcement, but the aviation bug really just took that over. Desiring to, to fly and desiring to go in the military, obviously there's a background of service, right? So I was in the airlines. There was nothing against it. I love the airlines, but I just kind of was sitting there and I was like, I'm going to do the same job in a different plane to a different destination, but it all kind of looks the same up front for the next 30 something years. And there's no variety to it. There's no opportunities to try something different. It's just going to be the same. And I, I don't like doing the same thing. I'm, I get too bored with it, I guess is the way to put it. So I always, I'm trying to do new things and experience new things and grow. And uh, the catalyst for me was becoming a federal flight deck officer. Those are the armed pilots after 9-11, you can carry a firearm in the cockpit issued by the government. So I went to Artesia, New Mexico for a week of training. And when I got there where the border patrol training facility is and stuff like that, I was like, this is it. I need to be in law enforcement because like I said, it wasn't anything against the pilots. But when I was looking at all these guys that I was there with that were pilots, and then I'm talking to all these instructors who were teaching firearms, just the sense of humor, the camaraderie, the attitudes were, were different. And I got along with those guys so well. I was like, I need to come do this because this is going to make me happy. And I could live a life of service and and adventure. And I was like, I'm full in. So that was my choice to leave. And it's been a wild ride. I've done some really cool stuff and developed some really good memories and have some scars along the way. But I, I worked at three different police departments. So I sat at a, at a university police department, which was awesome. Great people there right in downtown Chicago. But 
they didn't have planes or dogs or anything like that. So I went to another agency actually in the town I currently live in and then briefly worked there, which is another great agency with great people, but they didn't have planes, but they did have dogs. So then I came to state because they had planes and dogs and boats and SWAT and everything. So I was like, I'm going to go to the state because uh, I could try work a lot of different places, do highway interdiction, which I really wanted to do, be a canine handler. And now here I am as a pilot. So when you made the decision, Matt, that uh, I'm going to go, you, you got that bug to now go to law enforcement Did, in the back of your head was aviation already there where you said someday I do want to go to law, law enforcement someday I want to be in aviation law enforcement was that immediately there as a goal it was but it was one of those things where if it couldn't happen I would have still been fine and even to this day you know with the airlines everybody's talking about well you have all these qualifications you can make a lot of money in the airlines I don't really have any desire to go back to that lifestyle. I love what I do here and I love aviation in law enforcement, but if I had to go back to the road, I'd be okay with it. I said, if I had to go back and I would want to be a bloodhound canine handler and go track guys and bad guys in the woods. Uh, I, I'm really passionate still about canine. I still train with them. Uh, I don't want to talk about this stuff today, but uh, this is a great job. I love it. It's, it's adventurous. It's a lot of fun, a lot of really great people and great friends I've made. So like I said, just to, I guess to wrap it up. Yeah, it was it was a goal, but it was one that if I didn't attain it, it would have been okay. And and the flying in law enforcement is is not the same old thing. It's never the same old thing. No. Yeah. I mean, he, yeah. Every flight is is unique and different with weather and mission and crew mm-hmm. and all that. Uh, I've I've always was surprised for a while as a young uh, pilot and air crew member having ride alongs, including. Blue Angel pilots, including professional hockey players, mm. uh, which you would r- relate to. They were flyers. Yeah. Don't don't yeah. don't don't judge. <laughs> they were Philadelphia Flyers. No so th- But them saying, "Oh man, you got the best job in the world." Mm. A Blue Angel pilot saying that, yeah. and you're going, "What is this dude talking about?" You yeah. know, right. he, he's the slot man in the Blue Angels, and he's telling me I got the best flying job in the world. Yeah, yeah, we do. Said- Oh, yeah. we did. I, we're the, I did. You do. Yeah. I think we're the highest paid Cessna. We just joke. We're the highest paid Cessna pilots in the world. <laughs> but, and, you know, and the thing is, too, is sometimes we fly over downtown Chicago, not every night, but we uh, most nights of the week, we try to be over downtown Chicago, be in support of the mission there. And it, it's like the first two or three flights, you're like in awe of the skyline because it's a beautiful city, right? And then after a while, you just kind of, it's like work, right? And it, you're like, and then you have somebody riding with you and they're just glued to the window looking at the, at the sights. And you kind of like, you have to remember not to take it for granted because we're pretty lucky to be doing what we're doing. So I used to love ride alongs for that reason. And I think all the folks I work with would get mad because I'd always invite people out. Cause I love, I, one, I, <laughs> I loved, sh- I love the job so much. I love sharing it with people and I like to see their expressions on their face when we go fly and be like, and to hear them say what you're saying after a flight, be like, oh, that's the most amazing thing in the world because there are days when you forget how how awesome it is that you do that you do what you do because you get you know you get burdened with you know the the politics of the department or the current event of the day or whatever the thing is that takes your mind off of what you're doing but like you said you take off and you see the, the sunset you know as it's going down or for us it's la and for you it's chicago but you're like man we're getting paid to do this this is this is insane so I, I used to love yeah. ride alongs for that, you know. I've had a couple of buddies from my former team ride with us and it's always funny to see how they react. Like one guy was just so geeked up that he just couldn't stop talking the whole time. And I'm like, <laughs> hey, can you quiet down? Everything's getting picked up on the mic here. He's just yelling and stuff. And another guy, he was dead quiet. He's usually like kind of boisterous and talks and we're like, and I keep looking, I'm like, you're all right. And he's like, I'm having the time of my life back here. He was just so geeked up he couldn't talk. And I was like, that's yeah. pretty cool. That's funny. So well, uh, can you talk about now that we've touched on Chicago a little bit? Can you touch on the state agency and talk about what the agency is like, kind of broadly? You know, how many how many personnel you guys have, and what assignments are available, and and some of that. So, I work for the Illinois State Police, obviously, and broadly across the whole state police. I think we have like eighteen hundred troopers. It it varies, but I think it's about eighteen hundred statewide. So, we are a state police agency. Some states have highway patrol. Uh, which is strictly the highways. Obviously, the interstates and the highways are a priority for us, but our state police, we patrol everything. So we patrol off the streets, different you know rural areas, respond to calls and towns and things like that, patrol all those uh, rural routes and whatnot and, and get off the highways. But the highways are pretty much our big thing, especially in Chicago. The interstates are, are kind of our baby, right? So 
we have a lot of different things available in the state police being a big state police agency. So we have our backbone, which is patrol, right, on the highways. We obviously have aviation with fixed wing airplanes. We have canines. We have highway interdiction teams, which do drug interdiction and criminal addiction, human trafficking missions. Team I previously worked for was the statewide anti-violence enforcement team. They're teams that are in the major metro areas that are strictly, they don't do patrols, so they don't handle calls. They're strictly there to do proactive, like hard-nosed policing. I mean, it's like almost pursuits every night, some of these nights with teams like this. It's very aggressive policing, but aggressive and professional policing, which is which is awesome, right? We're doing it a really good right way, which I like because I think it's a good example for around the country. I think policing has changed and, and a team like this is doing it the right way with how it's going to be done from this point forward. We have investigative units that do homicide investigations, joint task forces. We have people assigned at every federal agency, ATF, DEA, DEA strike force. I mean, some of these these groups are getting 400, 500 kilos of dope a year doing you know cartel investigations in Chicago or highway interdiction stuff. We have forensics and crime scene. We have SWAT. Our SWAT team is very advanced with a lot of good equipment. Lucky guys are always out there patrolling on boats off the Chicago skyline in the summertime. There are, there's like six or seven. I get little videos that some of my buddies in SWAT will send me and they're out cruising, <laughs> you know, they call it the playpen where all the expensive boats are. And there's uh, pretty girls in bikinis out there and the SWAT guys in their camo are out cruising around. Right. So they have that. And obviously traffic is, is a big thing. So we have our traffic enforcement teams, motorcycle units, all that stuff. I think the only thing we don't have at this point is like horses. <laughs> yeah. So uh, things like that. So there's a lot of opportunities here, which is, like I said earlier, is why I wanted to come here because my career could have gone a lot of different directions. So it's gone the way I wanted it, but it had a lot of different ways that it could have gone because there's a lot of things to do. Yeah. That's the always what has inspired me with the larger agencies like LAPD and, and your agency. You know, I feel like you can change assignments every other year and probably never circle back towards the end of your career until you find aviation because you never want to leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> like nobody leaves that. Yeah. No, yeah, just, but you know that that's changing too, and I think it just kind of speaks to the larger climate that surrounds law enforcement right now. You've got folks that are leaving the industry just in general, if even if they're not in aviation, but in law enforcement, they're they're leaving. It's almost in some ways become a job instead of a career, which is a bummer. And I'm hoping that change changes as we go forward. I don't know how how we bridge that gap, how we start to change things back. You know, I don't know if it's more of a climate that from the media that's that's making it the way it is or or i know it's a combination of things but what are you guys seeing on your side with your agency when it comes to recruitment and retention and those types of things yeah i think there's it's we're seeing the same challenges everybody is right about not only just pilots but just in general finding qualified personnel because people just don't want to deal with it right not the opinions of my agency just personal opinion i think that it almost it got too far one direction where it was almost like we were pseudo military and going out there in the thin blue line and we're going to go out there and be aggressive and all that stuff. And it kind of got away from what I grew up with, with beat cops who literally walked the beat, right? They were twirling their baton, walking down the street. You got to know these guys. And then it kind of swung the other way where it was like, hey, we're compassionate people. We were part of the community because we were always that. It just, we weren't that in the media, right? So then we swung the other way and we're trying to show how compassionate we are, which we always have been, right? But then it's drawn away from, you know, recruitment comes from people who want to go out there and work, right? They want to get in car chases. They want to be aggressive police and put people in jail and, and help their communities from being victims of violent crime. But they don't see that because all they see is the kind of like, the, I, what I call it, I don't know another way to put it. I'm sorry to put it this way. is like touchy-feely policing, right? But the answer is that we've always been right in the middle. It's just what we portray, right? So we've always been right in the middle. Uh, what I've done my whole career of 12 years in law enforcement has always been right in the middle, been a very aggressive officer going out there and trying to put people in jail and, and, you know, make that difference that you, you sign up and you say, I want to make a difference, right? That's what we keep doing, but we've always done it professionally and compassionately at the same time being pretty aggressive and ready to handle business when we need to. Right. So I think that's kind of, we're swinging back and forth and that pendulum slowly just needs to stop right in the middle of where we've always needed to be that we're aggressive, but professional and respectful police officers. Right. So that's a great, that's a great analysis that you discovered there, Matt. Yeah. I mean, you, you really hit it on the head because it's, it's like that everywhere. As I travel around, I, I get to meet a lot of police officers. Not all departments are in the middle, uh, but most are. 
and and they do it successfully. Just like you said, you can be compassionate, you can be professional and aggressive. And some departments disagree with that completely. They say, oh no, we got we to do dance videos. Enough of this aggressive policing stuff. Uh, we got to show that we're 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 part of the you know part of them, and it's like no, we we're trying to enforce the law so that people can live in safety and not be in fear of crime. So your analysis, excellent job there, Matt. You really <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> nice, really nailed it. Yeah, and Jack, looking at your career, you know, LA, the city of LA seems to be the the, the forefront of politics and and media relations and all the things that surround law enforcement, at least on the West Coast. How have you seen things change over the course of your career to where they are now? And where do you kind of see it going from here? This is the end of part one of our conversation with Matt Saluka. Be sure to join us for part two, where we continue our conversation on recruitment and retention. We also continue to profile Matt's career in his aviation unit at the Illinois State Police. Stay tuned after a word from our sponsors for some Hangersy news. Cheers. Thank you to our sponsor, Metro Aviation. Metro Aviation, the world's largest family-owned air medical operator, offers comprehensive aircraft services with 140-plus aircraft in over 25 states. The Completions Center installs medical and law enforcement kits and avionics, serving diverse aviation needs, including offshore, utility, VIP, and corporate sectors. Thank you to our sponsor, Garmin. Be ready for the most challenging missions with the Garmin G500H TXI Avionic Suite. Get terrain and power line awareness, plus optional 3D synthetic vision and NVG compatibility with industry-leading product support. Details at Garmin.com. Thank you to our sponsor, CNC Technologies. CNC Technologies, serving law enforcement, government, and military markets with tailored mission solutions, system training, and live 24-7 support with cnc.live platform. Explore more at cnctechnologies.com. Thanks for sticking around to hear from our sponsors, because without their support, these conversations wouldn't be possible. I want to share some news with you all that's really exciting. The Hangersy Podcast team is expanding. We've added co-hosts to the podcast team that have different areas of expertise and come from different geographic regions. I'd like to welcome to the team Richard Brandon. He retired from the London Metropolitan Police Department. Clay Lacey, who works for Texas DPS. Brian Smith, who spent 10 years as the safety program manager for the Airborne Public Safety Association. He's also the current chief pilot for a large county sheriff's office in Florida. Nick Meeks from Tactile Flying. Mike Calhoun, who's a rescue pilot for Riverside County Sheriff's in California. And Tony Weber, who works for San Diego County Sheriff's as a fire and rescue pilot and is also a trainer for SR3. I look forward to hearing more from these men who have contributed so much to our industry. Catch you soon. Cheers. Time to close up the hangar. Thanks for joining us on the Hangar Z Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Helicasts.